This should be, most commentators agree, verse 44 ought to start here. There ought to be a paragraph break, and so that's reflected in your Bibles. It says, but while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. So you get here in the first part, <clears throat> excuse me, 43b through 45, our first common stumbling of the disciple, which is that we can be slow to learn and to apply the gospel to our lives. We can be slow to learn <clears throat> and to apply the gospel to our lives. Look there at the end of that verse where it picks up the new paragraph. But while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, <clears throat> Catch this there, right? Who's marveling at all that Christ is doing? Everyone, right? Everyone. That's everyone that's there. It's the crowd that is gathered around. It's the scribes and the Pharisees and the legal experts that have just been arguing with the disciples about this demon-possessed child. It's the disciples also who are there. Everybody is marveling at all that he was doing, right? There's, a, there's an issue in there in that everybody is distracted, in essence, by that which Christ does rather than remembering who he is, right? You see that? Everyone's essentially distracted, in essence. There's the statement that they were all amazed at the greatness of God. But rather than being amazed at the greatness of God and that driving them to the question of who he is, they're stuck here marveling at all that he's doing, all that he's been doing in his Galilean ministry, all of it. And they're just marveling at what he's doing, and they're missing, they're distracted from who he is. And it's not just the crowds. It's not just the legal scribes and Pharisees. It's also who? The disciples. All right, give them a break. All right. We're so hard on those guys, aren't we? So often. How could they not see it? You know, they're so dumb. You know, we don't use dumb in our house. All right. Don't do that. All right. All well, you kids are here. Okay. All right. And they just, how can, they're so blind and stubborn and obstinate and just, you know, it's so, All right. Be careful. Okay. Be careful. Right, they're included. They're also marveling at at uh, all that he was doing. They're distracted. Can that ever happen to you and I? By the way, right? We ever get distracted by all that Jesus is doing? Right? All that God is doing. Maybe it's the success of the gospel in a people group somewhere in a faraway country, and you've heard a report of it. Maybe it's the deliverance of a pastor who's been put in jail for his faith. Right? or the freeing of a missionary who was kidnapped. Maybe it's closer to home. Maybe it's the healing of a friend from cancer or disease. Or maybe, maybe it's simply the looking around at a brother or sister in Christ who has a, a very deep, genuine joy and peace, and you see that in them. You see what God's doing in their lives, or a delight for God's Word and biblical theology, right? And you're, you're seeing all that God is doing. And there's a good marveling in it, but it, in essence, begins to distract you from who he is, right, and what he's done and what that means for your life. That's what can happen if we're not careful. We can marvel at all it is that God is doing or all that it is that God has done through Christ, and we forget, don't we, to apply the gospel to our life every day, right? Do we even... Sometimes we wrestle with what that even means. What's it like to get up every day and remember the death of Christ for us and the meaning that has for us in our lives, right? Jesus knows that we can struggle with that. And so in the midst of their marveling, what does he do? He, he says to his disciples, come here, right? Hey, come over here. Let's talk, right? And so he pulls them aside to remind them, don't get distracted. In essence, don't get distracted by kingdom things. These are signs of the coming of the kingdom in Christ. Don't get distracted by those. Let me pull you back to the center and what you need to keep your eyes focused on. Right? And sometimes when you get to dabble in the 
original languages, this is where he just, he can't help but think of Yoda. I know, that doesn't make sense yet, right? Okay, but if you like Star Wars and Star Trek and you're just kind of nerdy like I am, all right, Yoda comes to mind here. Has anyone ever studied German in here? Anybody? No? Spanish? No, Spanish doesn't work. Sometimes. All right. There's some languages. Let me just explain this to you because it, it, it applies. There's some languages that are very fluid. So you can put the verb up front. You can put the pronoun that's like two-thirds of the way through the sentence all the way to the front of the sentence. And you can do that so that you can give emphasis to things, right? And so oftentimes in Greek, Greek's very fluid that way, the original language is. And so if you read this literally word for word uh, in your Bible, it says, let these words sink into your ears. Right? Listen up. Right? In the language, it's put you into your ears, these words. And can't you hear Yoda saying that? Right? Put you into your ears, these words that I say to you. Uh, you know. All right? And so it... it He's saying to them, the imperative comes up front. He's stressing the imperative. Put them, right? You, you is emphasized next. Not everybody. Everybody's marveling at what he's doing. But you, his disciples who are following him, put them, you, these words I'm about to speak to you into your ears. In other words, let it sink into your thick heads right? In the common vernacular, you thick-headed disciples, okay? Listen up, right? And he says to them, for the Son of Man, here's the words, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Now, the Son of Man, remember, he used, just back up the passage, chapter 9, verse 22, right after Jesus, or Peter says, Uh, confesses, he says to, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are God's Messiah, verse 20. And then Jesus says, it's not time yet to make that common knowledge, so don't tell this to anyone. But he further underscores it and says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And so the Son of Man must, that fly is going to get me in a minute, I'm going to get it, one or the other. All right. The Son of Man must suffer, be rejected, die, and be raised again. Right? He's going back to the sinner. This is why I've come. This is who I am, God's Messiah, the Son. And this is my death. I must suffer, die, be rejected, and die. And be raised. You remember... We don't stop in 22. You go to 23. Does he apply that to them? He sure does, doesn't he? Right? Verse 23, and he says to them, if anyone wants to come after me, what does he need to do? Deny himself, take up his cross. What's the next word? Daily and follow me. Right? Don't be distracted by all the glitz and the glamour, what's going on, all that God is accomplishing, and let that keep you from remembering who Christ is, what he's done, and how that is to have its effect in your life, right? That you too, his death becomes your life, to suffer if God wills it, to die, to be rejected, even to die, so that others might have life and live. The musts in 922 of Christ's death become the must in 923 of the disciples' life, right? And so that's what he's reminding them of. He's taking them back to the center. But you go to verse 45. It's a difficult verse. They didn't understand the statement. It was concealed from them so they wouldn't perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about the statement. Now, You have kind of a sandwich there. They didn't understand it at the beginning, and at the end, they were afraid to ask him about it. And in the middle, it was concealed from them. We're not told much about uh, how it was concealed, by who or by what it was concealed, or why it was concealed, just that it was. And so we start looking in the context before we start making conclusions and, and I think Linsky picks up on this really well, that we need to at least start within the hearts of the disciples, 
right? They're, it's, they're having a hard time understanding it. They didn't understand the statement. And what did they do? Jesus, what does that mean? Is that what they did? No, right? They were afraid to ask him about it. And why was that? Why do you think? He, they know in his words, he's driving them back to, I'm going to die. And if you follow me, you have to be ready to die. Right? And if, have you ever done that? You're reading a text or you hear those words and you go, man, those are true. I'll think about them later. Right? What they really mean? Because if I really sit down and think about what those words mean for my life today, what's that mean for me? I'm going to have to change something, aren't I? To respond to those words, to follow Christ, means I'm going to have to think through life. Something has, is going of necessity to be changed. And I'm not sure I really want to do that yet, right? And so they were afraid to ask him about the statement. And, there, and it was difficult to understand. And those two things compound together, at the very least, to keep that truth and the application of it hidden from them. Now, there are some that will say, well, of course, it's Jesus here who keeps it hidden from them. It's not borne out directly from any of the verb tensing in the language or anything in the text there that Jesus is purposefully keeping that hidden. But you can't pass up that there are certain things, like if he'd wanted that to be clarified to them, he could have pressed that home to them. Instead, he graciously lets that lie until such a time as he goes to the cross and he dies and is resurrected. He has his last words and he's ascended and the Spirit comes and all that he's taught to them clicks together and it makes sense and they remember it. And so you don't want to take that out as a part of what's going on, but I think there's something there because it's all too human, isn't it? That we don't understand and we don't want to ask prayerfully, Jesus, what's that mean? I remember James chapter 1 made me think of this. Right? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him what? Ask God, right? Who gives to all generously and without reproach. See, they wouldn't have even had to worry about Jesus getting on to him for it. Right? And it will be given to him. Right? But they do not ask, right? Does that, does that ever happen to us, right? We ever get distracted like that? We see all that God is doing in the world. And we get excited about it. We marvel at it. And in essence, then we forget daily to renew ourselves and who Christ is, what he's done for us, and what that means for us. That's just an aspect, remember, that comes out of this not maintaining your faith, a reminder of who he is and what he said, what he's called you to do, and resting and trusting in that and following, right? So that's the first one. We can be slow to learn and apply the gospel to our lives. All right, secondly, verses 46 to 48, we can become more interested then in what we receive than how we are to serve one another. We can become more interested in what we are to receive than how we serve one another. It's not just that we can be slow to apply the gospel to our lives, all right, but we can become more interested in what we'll get from it, from Christ or from God or out of the kingdom, than how we're to serve others. And that we're already kind of leaning that direction, aren't we? If you begin to marvel at all that God's doing, isn't it kind of human nature that you start thinking about, well, what could he do for me, right? You're sitting around and daydream, if I say this and then God does that, and don't lie, you've done it, right? I sure hope he makes this happen and that happen, this goes away, and this is kind of how I want the next four days to go, what God could do, you know, for me, right? And they're already leaning that way. They're marveling at what God is doing, what Christ is doing. And they begin to think about what that means for them. And that becomes very apparent in the text, 46 through 48. They're now, we know from parallel text, they're on their way to Capernaum, Peter's house. It's one of the last times they'll stop there before Jesus goes to Jerusalem. And they have a discussion, right, on the way, a good Christian discussion on the way. In verse 46, what's it start with? An argument. They, an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest, right? 
You know how that went, you know, that it was Andrew saying, well, Peter, you're, you're, just, you're so strong and just certain of everything. I'm sure that you're going to be closer to Jesus than me. I, I'll probably just barely make it in, you know, to heaven. That's how Christian arguments go, right? All right. Oh, you're so humble and you love Jesus and I, I just, I, you're going to be right there and I'm going to be singing in the back, you know. You know you've all said it before, haven't you? Right? And talking about somebody or to somebody. That's not what's going on right here. They're having an argument about who would be the greatest. Look at what Jesus can do. We're marveling at that and that turns to what that might be for us, right? They're arguing which one of us is the greatest. And that's what happens, isn't it? When you don't maintain the faith, you're not continually humbled by the grace of God and remembering who he is, what he's done for you, Christ's death, and what that means for your life. You leave room, don't you, for self-centered pride to enter in and settle in the heart, right? It's interesting here you see both an individual and a group pride. So they're arguing together about who would be the greatest individually. Who's it going to be? Is it going to be Peter? Nah, Peter, you open your mouth too much and you stick that big old foot right in there every time. It's not going to be you, you know. James and John, you sons of thunder, y'all are just too violent. Can't be you guys. You know, someone else, you know, I'm, I've been calm and meek, flown under the radar. I don't ever get in trouble. All right, some of you, that's you, right? Uh, I'm going to slip right in there past you guys. I'm the dark horse candidate for who's greatest in the kingdom. And they're arguing who's the greatest individually. But there is tacitly in this a group pride too. They're acknowledging, hey, we're all the, we're the 12. As a group, we're going to have great positions in the kingdom. Do we ever do that? Bible churches, right? We're the Bible church. We get a lot of it right. All right. We're going to be close to the throne. Our doctrine's straight. Yeah, all right. That's kind of how they are. They're acknowledging that we'll all have a position, just who's going to have the best one. We're going to be closer. I'm going to be greater. But we're all going to be there. And so there's there's an individual pride and there's a group pride. Now, verse 47, what happens? Is there a thought you ever have or a conversation you ever have quietly that Jesus doesn't know what's going on? Jesus knowing what they were thinking in their heart? When you read the parallel text over in Mark chapter 9, they get to the house and he calls them out on it. Hey, guys, what were y'all call, talking about on the way up here? <laughs> How do you like that question? You hear a pin drop there, right? It says, and they were silent. They didn't say a word, right? So just a minute ago, they won't speak up and ask for wisdom. And now they won't speak up and confess their guilt and their sin and repent. They're silent. Maybe he doesn't know what we were talking about back there while we were following him on the way. But he knows, and so it says he took a child, and he stands him next to him, and he begins to teach him. Now, anytime Jesus uh, takes a child and stands him there and begins to teach his disciples, uh, he's not talking about the child, per se. He's talking about Christians, and the child is the object lesson for the Christian, right? That you have to be like that child. As a matter of fact, when you look at the parallel text in Matthew 18, he says, you must Return and be like this child or you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Guys, pride, that's not, that's not going to work, right? You have to be like the child. You didn't bring yourself into this life. It wasn't your effort. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't your doing that made you be born and have life. That was done for you by God's grace. And you still are dependent upon your father for everything you receive. And you need to have that childlike faith and trust in your father. So you need to be like him. And so he, he stands the child next to him. He says, whoever receives me, this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. And so here's what he's saying. Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Now in my name is not authority, right? That's one thing that's offered up. It's also not simply uh, in my name. In other words, this is a brother or sister in Christ, and so you're recognizing that's another Christian, and so you're accepting them into fellowship. It's not that either. Right? To receive, whoever receives this child or one like this, a Christian, 
in my name. Remember, we're in the ancient Near East. If a sovereign king can't himself come visit you, what does he do? He sends his ambassador, right? And he comes how? In his name. And you have to receive him in his name, meaning he's his proxy, and you receive him as if he were the king himself. And you treat him like he were the king himself. You receive him with honor and pomp and circumstance and hospitality and genuine acts of love and service befitting to his station. So, guys, you shouldn't be talking about who's greatest over one another in the kingdom. You ought to be concerned about serving one another as if you were serving me. Does that make sense? Receive the brother and sister in Christ in my name. If you receive my representative as if it were me, then it makes sense. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So you're not only receiving me, you're receiving the Father in heaven who sent me, who sends that one to you. And so how you treat one another in this conversation you're having has a lot to do with showing where your heart is and who you are and whether or not you've received Christ and the God who sent him or not. He goes a little further. He says, for the one who's least among all of you, this is the one who is great. The one who's least among all of you, this is the one who is great. And so you are to humble yourselves to become least among all of you, to serve other believers. All right? This is the one who is great. It's interesting to note here, they were arguing about who was greatest. Jesus doesn't go back and say, if you humble yourselves the most, you're the greatest. He's not concerned that you be the greatest in the kingdom. He's simply concerned that you be great for the kingdom. Your concern shouldn't be that you're the greatest in the kingdom. I think, and I've thought this for a long time too, I think really the depth of this statement is that he's really pointing to himself. Because he says, for the one who is least among all of you, right, in your midst among all of you, this is the one who is great. Who's the one that's like that? It's Jesus, isn't it? He's the one who humbled himself the most and served those that the fathers bring into himself and died so that we could live. But even in that, he's saying you again, pointing back to 9, 22 and 23. What is it? My death becomes your life. Don't be more interested in what you're going to get out of the kingdom. You should be more concerned about how you serve one another. Because in that, you're following me. You're looking like I do, right? That's an easy one for us to fall into. Thirdly, 949 and uh, for, verse 49 and 50. And these, these start to cascade on top of each other. We're not maintaining our faith, remembering who God is, what he said to us, who Christ is, what he's done for us, that his death becomes our life. Uh, we can begin to be distracted, Right? Uh, we can be slow then to apply the gospel to our lives. We can become more prone to look for what we'll receive rather than serving. And here, thirdly, 49 and 50, we can become too exclusive rather than being appropriately inclusive. We can become too exclusive rather than appropriately inclusive. It would seem as if in verse 49, John hears what, P what Jesus says there, in 46 through 48, and he begins to think back probably on verses 1 through 6 of chapter 9 when they were sent out to heal and to preach. And they came across somebody there. He says, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he doesn't follow along with us. And so John starts to think through, it matters how I treat those who are Christ's. And I don't know that we did right by this guy, right? We may have been too exclusive rather than appropriately inclusive. And so he asked. Now, this is good. A moment ago, they didn't understand something and no one would ask. And now John, not quite understand something, he asks. Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. Now, this isn't like the sons of Sceva in Acts 19. You remember that? These sons of Sceva. 
They see Paul doing mighty things in the name of Jesus. They don't know Jesus. They try to cast out a demon. And they say, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. Uh, we don't know him. Paul knows him. We figure you know him. Paul does great things. It's a powerful name, so you got to listen to us because we're going to quote his name to you. In the name of Jesus that Paul knows and preaches, come out. And what happens to those guys? They get beat and tarred and feathered and run out of Dodge, right? Okay. It's not, that's not what's going on here. They tried and it didn't work. This guy, they see someone casting out demons. It's not just an attempt. He's apparently successful at it. So he apparently has genuine faith. He's in Christ. He's Christ's follower, a disciple, right? And he's casting out demons in the name of Christ. So what's the problem? Why did they try to prevent him? Because he does not follow along with us. They're not sure he's one of us. We ever do that? Oh boy, right? Start thinking about other churches or denominations, right? Or people, I'm not sure they're of us, right? And that, that's their issue. We're, we're not sure he's one of us. Not just one of the 12, they know he's not one of the 12, and not just the 70, at one point Jesus sends out the 70, he's apparently not one of them, right? He's apparently made probably not even one of the regular followers that's been with Jesus throughout his Galilean ministry, somebody who somewhere along the way has heard the message, received it, and now he's gone another direction and he's doing ministry. What does Jesus say to them? Stop him. No, what's he say? All right, verse 50, don't hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. Don't hinder him. He who's not against you is for you. Now, there needs to be a little bit of a clarification here, right? All right, what Jesus is not driving at, because if we keep this in the context of the rest of Scripture, what he's not saying is anybody who claims the name of Jesus, partner up and don't get in their way, Right? Don't be critical of that ministry or that theology. That's not what he's saying, right? Anybody who claims to be doing ministry in the name of Christ, they're they're okay. That's not what he's saying, right? Because we know later when he gets to Jerusalem, he'll say to his apostles, Mark 13, 22, false prophets will arise. They'll show signs and wonders in order if they can to lead astray even the elect, if possible. John Right, who's here asking this question? John later in First John will write, "It is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists, those who teach falsely, have appeared." Or Paul, Galatians one six. I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which really is no other. It's not another gospel. It's no gospel at all. But even if we, this is an astounding statement. Or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we've preached. He is to be anathema, accursed, right? So it's not just anybody in the name of Christ, right? It is those who are actually in Christ and doing ministry for Christ. In other words, if somebody is not truly converted and they're a false they have a false gospel. They're a false prophet, right? There's a thick line in the sand. You don't partner in and support those ministries. But somebody may be in Christ and on the central ideas of who God is and who Christ is and what he's done for you, and what salvation is, we agree. But he has different ideas on secondary doctrinal matters or his ministry takes him a different direction from you. That's okay. You can support them. You don't hinder them, you can pray for them, and you can even cooperate with them. Does that make sense? That's what he's driving at here. Don't hinder him, for if he's not against you, he is for you, right? Have you ever made that error? Yeah, you have. I have too, right? We've all struggled with these. Here's the last one, verse 51 to 56. See if this one, you ever struggle with this one. I know you have because we just had an election, right? And I've seen all the stuff on Facebook and everywhere else, right? Uh, Chapter 9, verse 51 to 56, the final one is you can lack compassion for those who most need it. You can lack compassion for those who most need it. It makes sense, right? Not maintaining your faith, 
not applying the gospel to your lives regularly so that you begin to be concerned about what you get rather than how you serve one another. You can become too exclusive rather than appropriately inclusive. And you can see how all that would stack together and you could lack compassion. Right? Verse 51, here's where in the narrative of Luke, Jesus now leaves the Galilee and he's going to the cross. When the days were approaching for his ascension, verse 51, he's not just looking at the cross, he's looking through it to going back to the Father, which means that he's seeing also his suffering and his death and his resurrection and then his ascension. He's determined to go to Jerusalem, verse 52. And so he sends messengers on ahead of him. When a large group was traveling through an area and they needed to stop in or near a town, they would send messengers ahead to make arrangements. And so these messengers enter a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him, verse 52. So if you're going to go from the Galilee to Jerusalem, you've got to go through Samaria. Samaria is comprised of a large part of what used to be the northern kingdom of Israel. If you remember early on in Israel's history, there's David, Saul, David, Solomon, and it splits under Rehoboam, right? And the northern kingdom establishes their own place of worship, Mount Gerizim. So Jesus apparently is coming nearby there in a village that is near to there. They would have known who he was. They would have heard all the rumors. They would have been guessing at who he was themselves. They know, though, for sure he doesn't agree with their worship. And he's not stopping there. He's going to Jerusalem. So they're being exclusive, too. And they say, you can't stay here. They don't receive him. And you got to love James and John, the sons of thunder, Right? They just take that with equanimity and peaceful hearts, don't they? Right? Lord, verse 54, when they heard this, you want us to command fire down from heaven and consume them? Right? Torch them right now. Take them from the face of the earth. How's that for compassion? Right? They don't know who you are. They're not acknowledging who you are. They're not realizing you're God's Messiah. They're not bowing the knee. They're not humbling before you. No wonder they don't worship the God of heaven. They worship at their own place, not Jerusalem. They've got their own religion, their own worldview, their own ideology, their own theology. We're going to condemn them for not recognizing the Messiah of God. We're going to call fire out of heaven on them, right? Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what they're really thinking of is not that. 2 Kings chapter 1, if you haven't read that in a while. <clears throat> Good old Ahab dies, right? He's succeeded by Ahaziah. Ahaziah has a fall and apparently gets an infection and he's dying. And he sends messengers to an idol to get word about what's going to happen to him. And God tells Elijah, go intercept those messengers and you send a word back to Ahaziah. The idol's dead. You're not going to get a word from him. The God of heaven says, you're not coming off the bed. You're going to die. Well, understandably, Ahaziah doesn't receive that so well. So he says to a, a captain, you go get him and bring him here. I want to talk to him. So there's a captain sent out with 50 men. Second Kings chapter 1. And Elijah is sitting out on a hill. Have you read this one in a while? It's a crazy story. This captain comes rolling up, and in the authority of the king, he's the one that's come from the king, and he says, the king says, come. And Elijah says, if I'm a prophet of God, let fire come from heaven. And <laughs> Crispy critters, 51 of them. <laughs> Elijah doesn't show up. As I send another captain with 50 more men. Stands up there. The king says, not just come, come now. He says, come quickly. He adds to it a little bit. Been a little more forceful. Come on. If I'm a prophet of heaven, let fire. <laughs> Crispy critters. Elijah doesn't show up. He sends another captain with 50 more. You think he'd get a clue, right, at some point. The captain showed up and he got a clue. He looked around. He sees 102 dead bodies on the ground. 
like they come from Pompeii and Vesuvius has rained molten lava on them, right? And he looks and he doesn't say, come now. He, he bows and he begs for his life, right? Please don't kill me like you've done to them, right? And God says to Elijah, you can go with that man because he'll take care of you, right? The disciples, John and James, they were just on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and Elijah and Moses, with Elijah. And they're thinking about Elijah, right? And the pompousness and the arrogance of somebody rejecting God and the one that God has sent. We'll just call fire down on them. Jesus, you can just sometimes wonder how soul-wearied he must have been, right, with these guys. But how soul-wearied is he with us so often? Right? He turns to them and rebukes them, verse 55, and says, you don't know what kind of spirit you are of. Now, there's two ways you could take that. Some want to capitalize the spirit and say, look, guys, you're not getting who you are. You're now following me. You're in me. I'm in you. Even though you haven't been sealed permanently yet, the Spirit is at work in you, and you're not acting like you're of the Spirit of God. right? Or it could be more like when Jesus looks at Peter and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. right? That you're not realizing the Spirit that you're speaking from. And it's vague enough probably to leave both of those options on the table. Right. As academians and theologians, most often we've got to argue and we've got to get the one. It's this one for these reasons. There's five of them, and I reject that one for seven. Right? Sometimes when it's vague, it's on purpose. You say, which is it? Yes, it's both, possibly. Let's not press it too far. Both are viable. Right? Here's the main point, though. It's not that. It's this. For the Son of Man... Son of Man takes you back to 9.22, right? For the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected and die and be raised again. For the Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives or their souls, in other words, suke, but to save them. I'll come later to judge. Right now, I'm here to save. I didn't send you to judge do we judge and condemn and lack compassion sometimes often as we're dealing with those who reject Christ because they have no life in them? Can you identify with the disciples? Have you wanted to call fire from heaven over the last year or two? All right, no matter which side of the spectrum you may lean to, okay? You don't know the spirit you're of in this. I didn't come to destroy it. I came to save them. And I sent you, chapter 9, 1 through 6, to preach the message of salvation. And when I die and I'm resurrected, and before I'm ascended, I'm going to send you again. And everybody who comes after you, and I'm going to say, go make disciples. Right? You see it? Do you struggle with any of those four? You probably have and may be with all of them. Those are common issues and stumblings that we have as disciples as we follow Christ. How do you overcome those, grow past those, work through them? You go back to maintain your faith. You go back to the center of this text, Jesus dying, becoming your life. That you deny yourself, take up your cross, you follow Christ. You remember who he is, sovereign, savior, and what he said. Go make disciples. And you maintain your faith by being in his word daily, right? Then you apply the gospel to your life, right? Then you serve one another. Then you cooperate appropriately with other believers in ministry. Then you have compassion for the lost. Then you go make disciples. Father, we thank you for this text, the truths that it teaches to us, nourishment it is to our souls. God, the correctives they bring. The reminder, God, that you are gracious to us. We've seen Christ in these passages be gracious to his disciples and handle them tenderly and compassionately. And you do to us the same way. 
So, Father, instruct us and teach us and guide us into all truth by your Spirit that we might grow in Christ, that we might grow through these stumblings, God. We might grow up in Him, following Him, that you might be made known and honored through us, your servants. In Jesus' name, we pray these things together. Amen.